that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 560th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. Tom, you there? <laughs> but not in the studio. He's in the flesh, but not in the studio. Yeah, okay. Uh, like every other issue of uh, edition of Energy Week, the information in this one comes from my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. Uh, you can go there and click on the calendar to find the, the date for the, for the uh, material we're talking about. We're starting on the 8th of February and going up to the 15th. Um, we almost always record these shows on Thursday. It happens that this week is called Energy Week um, 2-15, 2024, but it's actually, we're recording it on Friday because of um, the way that re the recording studio had to work this week. So um, you can also go to a couple of sites or you can, to a site or, a, or get a download uh, lower on the screen if you're watching this on a computer. Um, and uh, there, so there's a number of different ways that you can get to the actual uh, articles that we're uh, referencing and using. So these, the, the articles all have links, but you're not going to get them on, on your computer, I don't think, but you just sue them. And some yeah. of them are very good articles to begin with. Yeah, they're, they're pretty interesting. So should we go, Tom? Can't dance. Can't dance, okay. I will st we will start with a picture of a cargo ship that has rotor sails. And this uh, uh, article comes from Clean Technica. It's, yep, that's a good start. Yep, it's uh, 8th of February. What do you got for a title? Wind power returns to cargo ships. And now with plastic bottles. Well, plastic bottles is kind of a joke, but... Uh, it is, but it's real, too. Oh, it's real. It's really yeah. happening. The cargo shipping industry is slowly moving toward low emission fuels, and, uh, but in the meantime, wind power is ready and eager to go. Various forms of high-tech sails, there, those three things that look almost like funny white smokestacks on the screen are, in fact, funny sails. They're very interesting. We, we've done some articles about them. We have. They, they rotate. Yeah. They're showing up on the shipping lanes now, and to gild the sustainability lily, that's kind of hard to pronounce, sustainability lily. That's a, that's a uh, tongue twister. Some are made from recycled plastic bottles. Well, that's what they said, and it's true, but it's, you know, it's irrelevant, really. <laughs> well, it's... It's, it's not 100% irrelevant. I mean, it's good that they're recycling the plastic. I think what we have to do with plastic is not recycle it into ship sails, but in fact, stop using it altogether in... Well, there's a couple of places in the world where there's huge assemblies of dead plastic bottles yeah. floating around in the yeah, sea. Yeah, there are gyres. I mean, these, these, these worlds are huge. Yeah. The gyres, and they're, I don't know how many miles across they are, but I think the biggest might be a thousand miles across, where you just have dense accumulations of, of uh, things. It's kind of like when the, when the uh, Columbus and the other, other voyagers of that era crossed the Atlantic Ocean, they would run into the Saragasso Sea which, which had, um, it was full of seaweed, and they uh, thought that was pretty weird. Um, there are a lot of things that just get stuck in the ocean, and plastic, unfortunately, happens to be one of them. Should we go on, well, Tom? It, it, I, I could see this happening in the future. These become mines. 
I suppose they could. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a we'll picture. Wait to the next one, huh? Yeah, we'll go to the next one. We have a picture of Addis Ababa. And the title says, it comes from Queen Sectica, by the way. Yes, it does. Ethiopia banning non-electric car imports. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, it sure is. Details are a little thin at this point, but the Ethiopian Ministry of Transport and Logistics, Alemu Sime, I'm guessing at that pronunciation, recently said the country will not allow cars to enter the market unless they are EVs. Quote, a dis dis um, um, dis a decision has been made that the automobiles cannot enter Ethiopia unless they are electric. And that That's is, interesting. Yeah, it is. That's a quote from the uh, Minister of Transport and Logistics. Well, it's still earth-shattering earth because Ethiopia is not a very large country, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. It is, and it's kind of a bellwether step because what they're doing, if you look at, if you look at car markets in Africa, they are very heavily made up of um, recent of imported used cars, so cars yes. that that from all over the world. Are, Didn't we do something like this on this? I think we've talked about this before. I don't remember yeah. exactly why or when. I think but we did. The fact that they would say no to gasoline-powered vehicles is really kind of revealing of something that's going on. So I, I find that pretty interesting. Yeah, our next item, we have a picture with a, with a caption that says, where are we going? And Looks like it spoke to me. It sure does. And uh, this is from the BBC. And it says, and I quote, world's first year-long branch. Breach. World's first year-long breach of key 1.5 degree C winning li warning limits. Yeah, um, I want to. I want to bring Explain everybody. This, this isn't good news. No, this is not good news. I want to bring everybody's attention to some one thing in the caption of the photograph. Um, that symbol after what are we doing is called an entero bang. It's a it's a, a exclamation point superimposed over a question mark. Okay, um, let me read the synopsis. For the first time, global warming has exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius across an entire year, according to the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service. World leaders promised in 2015 to try to limit year, uh, the long-term temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, uh, which see, was, is seen as, a, as crucial to help avoid the most damaging impact. Now, obviously... And you're not doing it. Yeah, but it's worse than that. Um, we have two things this week that are really um, disturbing, and this is one of them. The, the, That's just disturbing. Yeah. The breach of 1.5 degrees was predicted to come. And it was predicted to be, come because the countries are not acting fast enough. And this is something that's well known. But it was predicted that it would come in 2030 or sometime after. Now, that was predicted maybe 2015. And here we are nine years after 2015, and we're already all the way to what was supposed to happen no earlier than 2030. We've so, hit the limits already. Yeah, we, we, are, we are at the limit. Now... One other thing that people should know is that some of the heat of this year came because of El Nino, which kind of warms up the entire world to some degree. But in general, we can say surely that climate change is happening much faster than anybody had predicted. And um, that's not good news. No, oh, that's bad news. Yeah, it's bad news. And there are still people who are denying that it's happening at all. And there are people who are saying one and a half degrees. Why is that a problem? One and a half degrees, just one and a half degrees. Well, it's one and a half degrees Celsius, which is two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. 
but two and a half degrees is just two and a half degrees. I'm used to uh, temperatures in this area that might get as low as 30 below zero Fahrenheit. And the lowest temperature I've seen looking rather closely this winter because of various conditions has been seven degrees Fahrenheit. That is, that is a, a much, much, much higher. I would expect an average low that would be below 10 below zero. Has it been a very cold winter? It has not been a cold winter. And I've been checking the, t the temperature daily and um, it's, it's just not, it's not cold. By the way, I want to tell you something, Tom, um, and everybody else. I was working the other day, and I, I came across a, uh, I, as I was working, I had a funny scent go by my nose, kind of a sweet scent, but it went away so fast I couldn't figure out what it was. And then later on in the day, I noticed it again, and then again, and then again. The next day, it was coming pretty pretty frequently. And about, I don't know, shortly into that day, I figured out what it was. The day after that, it was constant. And it happens that close to the, the uh, desk where I work, there were potted plants, two of which were, um, one was a, a um, Meyer, um, I'm sorry, a, a Persian lime, and the other one was blood orange. And they are both in bloom. So, it, yeah, and our, our Meyer lemons I showed, you know, last week, and, and they're, they're just glorious. Not lemons, by the way. Okay, our next item is um, a picture of a tokamak react, uh, reactor. That picture, by the way, is from 2016, and it's a actually an, a, a small reactor. If you look at that central post, off just to the right of it, at the far end is what looks like it's an open door with bars across, and right in the middle is a face. Do you see that, Tom? Say that again? Right to the right of that central post is... Uh, on there's the, a doorway. There's a doorway of some kind with bars across, and if you look carefully, right in the middle of that doorway, there's a face. Oh, is there? Yeah, you can see two eyes, and if <laughs> if you look closely, you can see a smile. Yeah, I can't see that on my on my screen. Okay, well, I'm sorry you can't. This is from News.AM Tech. What do you have for a title? Scientists set new record of nuclear fusion. Yeah, you know they've been trying to do this since I was about six years old, and um, that was that was over seventy years ago. And the record is happening in seconds. Yeah, I know, which is very impressive, all things considered. But when you consider the billions of dollars they have spent... Okay, let me read the, the synopsis. Using the joint European Taurus, a large toroidal device known as a tokamak, which is basically the same thing that's, as what's on the screen, except it's very much bigger, Scientists sustained a record 69 megajoules of fusion energy for five seconds. That's not a whole heck of a lot. No, it's not. Using only 0.2 milligrams of fuel, which is practically nothing, this amount of energy is sufficient to power approximately 12,000 households for five seconds. Now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 12,000 households, but it's only for five seconds. They've spent 70 years getting to this point. I don't know how many billions of dollars they've spent, but it's been a lot. And they've got enough... 70 years! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they're saying it's within sight that we can, we can keep this thing going, and, and that means that we could... Uh, provide enough power for 12,000 households in, on an ongoing basis for billions and billions and billions of dollars. It, it, is, it, it, it reminds me of, of something that we will talk about next week. Um, it was in the news today, and that was um, a question that was raised in Australia, whether nuclear energy is practical. 
And the reason that they, that they said there are four reasons for saying that nuclear energy is not practical, and then they named four nuclear reactors, one of which was the, the reactors that are being built in, in Georgia at Fodal, but also uh, I think it was, oh, I forget which one, but they, they were in the UK, France, and um, Finland. And in every case, the, the cost of the reactor uh, was 300% over budget. The reactor was 300% over budget. Money talks. It, that's getting expensive. I'm sorry. Absolutely. There is nothing cheap about nuclear reactors. And when you get into the question of solar or wind and batteries, you can get electricity that is just as as uh, uh, reliable, and you can get it for a quarter or a third of the cost. So anyway. Well, it's happening as we speak. It is happening as we speak. And uh, I should put up the next item. We have a picture of a wind farm offshore. Looks like it to me. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not actually an offshore wind farm. It's an offshore picture of an onshore wind farm or near shore well, wind farm. The islands, which are north, slightly north, slightly to the east of Scotland. Yeah, they're they're uh, interesting place, and I I kind of have a feeling that I would enjoy living there, but I doubt very many people would <laughs> from Brattleboro like to go to the Orkneys. This is from Renews. What do you House have? Renews, west of Orkney Wind Farm. Yeah. Orkney Island Council's Development and Infrastructure Committee gave its backing to the 2,000 megawatt, that's two gigawatts, west of Orkney offshore wind farm. The west of Orkney wind farm will have up to 125 turbines on fixed foundations, so these are not floating, 30 kilometers west of the Orkney mainland. First power is planned for 2029. Now, the... the um, the, the deal here is this is adding two gigawatts to the renewable energy in Scotland. And there's Orkney... And, the, and Orkney's not going to use that two gigawatts themselves. <laughs> Orkney's already exporting electricity to Scotland. Orkney is almost, a, almost a, a, an outdoor um, laboratory experimenting on different kinds of... of of um, renewable energy, and you have all kinds of stuff going on there. Well, this particular thing isn't an experiment. This is two gigawatts. And, and um, Tom will always tell you what a gigawatt is. A megawatt. That's right. It's two megawatts. So it's, have, they even have their own language. Who has their own language? People from Orkney. Orkney. I think... I mean, it's, it's Scottish, but, it, but the people from Scotland can't understand it. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, is it Orkney or Shetland where the... I think it's Shetland where they speak a weird dialect of Norwegian. But, uh -huh. but Orkney, I think you're right. I think it's Scottish, and I wonder whether it's uh, Gaelic or whether it's... Um, uh, I think it's Gaelic. I think it's Scottish Gaelic. Well... Or, you know what it is? It's Scots. Scots. Which is a form of English. Yeah, it's Scots is a form of English, and um, but it it I don't I think it probably is Scots because I, you know I, I know uh, the the Celtic languages there's six of them and the I I know that there's uh, Cornish which is gone and Manx which was gone and now it's a living language again because people who learned it as as older than in their households, have started using it in their households and raising their kids that way. So it's been reborn. But um, Interesting. Yeah, and then you've got Breton, which is in France, and the French have been trying to kill it. Um, but that, they're not the only people who have tried to kill Celtic languages. The Welsh went through that for a long time. Okay, we shouldn't be talking about language. We should be talking about energy, and I'm sorry. But here we go. We well, let's look at a picture of some more wind turbines. More wind turbines and the sun setting. And 
that sunset reminds me so much of a ch children's book that I had when I was probably about three or four years old, and I really loved it. It was about a firefly climbing a cattail because of the, of the light coming from the moon. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't it? I wish I had a copy, but I, I've never been able to figure out what it was. Okay, this is from KUNM, which I think is probably a, well, certainly a radio or a TV radio station. The radio station, and the NM stands for New Mexico. Oh, thank you very much. I should have that's, seen that. That's and what we're about maybe, to see. Maybe UNM is University of New Mexico. It is. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, what do you got for title? Well, New Mexico bill would create new tax credits for renewable energy facilities. A New Mexico Senate bill aims to make the state more attractive for renewable manufacturing. The Advanced Equipment Income Tax Credit Bill would create a tax credit for qualified manufacturing facilities related to solar and wind energy components. And that's an interesting uh, idea because they're not, this particular bill is not intended to, um, to make it particularly, especially more advantageous to build solar farms or wind farms in New Mexico. It makes it more advantageous to, to build solar panels, the clips, the rails, the whatever to, you know, and also wind turbine blades and all kinds of things that would... Um, well, this is a whole new market and the yeah. various states are trying to get involved in it because right now China dominates that, that market. Yeah, we've got, uh, I think, I can't remember whether it's this week or if not, it will appear next. We'll be talking about a plant going into, I think it's this week, we're talking about a plant being built in North Carolina where they would manufacture um, I think it's this week. It's yeah. this is a portent of things to come. Yeah, it is. And w the United States is rebuilding its, its, its uh, manufacturing base. And the reason is because, partly because we need to have some kind of assurance that we're going to be able to get a components that well, are, Biden is pushing for tax credits to, to help yeah. out a lot of them. Yeah. Okay, we're up to Saturday, February 10th. And we nice have... Nice picture of the sea. This is the sea. I joined the Navy to see the world. Huh? Right? I joined the Navy to see the world. Yeah, but, what did I see? I saw the sea. <laughs> <laughs> that was... This was from CNN. It sure does. And it says, and I quote... Critical Atlantic Ocean current system is showing early signs of collapse, prompting warning from scientists. This is the, That's not good news. Not good news. This is the second thing. We will have some other news that is good this week, but this is the second thing that's disturbing. And what they're saying basically is that the Gulf Stream and the, the ocean currents that are associated with that are showing signs of collapse. And we've talked about this before. We have. And what they're saying now is that it could conceivably collapse as early as next year. But that would do a big thing to change the weather. Oh, not just weather. Just, I mean, yeah, weather. It means that Northern Europe would, ha would be a place where the Gulf Stream is no longer keeping it warm. No, the Gulf Stream keeps Norway, uh, Norway warm. It keeps Germany warm. It keeps France warm. It keeps, to a certain extent, it keeps uh, Spain warm. It keeps uh, England warm. And, you know, if you think about it, almost all of England is farther north than almost all of Germany. Almost all of the UK is farther north than almost all yeah, of Germany. Uh so these almost, people are suddenly going to be wearing rogue jobs. Yeah, almost all of Germany is farther north than almost all of Vermont. And yeah. wh what happens when those places all of a sudden get to... I mean, I had a girlfriend once who was English, and she told me that in, in her part of England, which was just south of London, which is in the southern part of England, um, she said if the, if the 
temperatures went above 78 degrees or something like that, everybody went on strike. And I said, well, what happens when it snows? And she says, when it snows, they don't have to call a strike. Um, nobody, because nobody can go to work. And literally, people cannot, the railroads got shut down in those days because there was half an inch of snow on the tracks. I mean, this is unheard of. They're going to have to get snow plows. How yeah. do, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that, but the thing that bothers me is all of a sudden, and this is going to happen um, in a, to a huge degree in Europe, but it will happen um, across the world to, to lesser degrees. Farmers are going to have to switch crops without knowing what they're doing. Yeah. And that means that one of the first things I would assume that would come out of this kind of problem would be a um, shortage of food because people will go to the stores and buy as much food as they can. Um, you know, I mean, when we had, when we had COVID, they, people went to the stores and bought all the toilet paper they could. Yeah. What's the connection? Well, the connection was they didn't want to have to go to the stores. And they figured that they would have to go to the stores if they ran out of toilet paper. And so they bought all the toilet paper they could as fast as they could, and the toilet paper all disappeared in about three days, you know. Well, this time I think it, it could be food and possibly some other things. So um, I, think, I think people should be prepared. First of all, don't panic, but also they should be prepared for sh sh food shortages. And oh, that, so this they say should should it will be happening. Yeah, if if this happens and when it happens, we will, I'm sure, face very. Let me put it this way: very unusual times. We don't know that it's going to happen soon, but they're saying that the early signs of collapse are all already there. And one other thing that bothers me about this is that everything associated with uh, climate change has been happening much faster than the scientific models have predicted. So, Unfortunately. Yeah. Now, we, as I said, we have some good news. So let's just keep going. Let's move along. We got a picture of some wind turbines. We do. And this is from the Greek Herald. And those wind turbines are, as I recall, actually in Greece. I can believe that. Yeah. So what do you have for a title? Greece breaks records in renewable energy for 2023. Well, that's good news. Yeah, and, but just, you know, for, for, for people watching, just pay attention to the numbers here. The share of renewable energy production, including hydropower plants, reached a historic high in 2023 in Greece at 57%. It was the first time that more than half of Greek electricity was generated by renewable source resources. This came about as Greek wind power capacity exceeded five gigawatts for the first time. This kind of record breaking thing is happening constantly. It's Greece, it's Spain, it's Portugal. Oh, this is the news. As you build more and more wind turbines, you're gonna be breaking more and more records. It's Absolutely. Just, you know, something that you've got to be prepared for. So, our next our next item is from Clean Technica. We have a picture of Michael Mann. Is that who that is? That's who it is. Believe How it or not, that? that's who it is. Michael Mann awarded a million dollars by a jury in a defamation suit. We've been hearing a lot about defamation suits because... This is interesting. Yeah, because Donald Trump has had defamation suits. But in this case, Michael Mann um, had a... Well, let me read the, the, the uh, uh, synopsis. Yeah. Climate scientist Michael Mann is known for developing the image called the hockey stick, hockey stick graph. And that's a graph where things are mostly flat and then suddenly they go up. Yep. Um, that image has been used in many papers and reports over the years. It's also induced attacks on man that were funded by fossil fuel interests. They wouldn't do a thing like that. No. Well, he did sue them and he won. 
<laughs> got a million dollars out of it. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I, it, it covered his legal expenses, as I understand it. I don't think it gave him a lot of money. But, you know. Yeah, that's for sure. It's vindication. Okay, here is a picture of a forest on the Columbia River. You know the Columbia River? Yeah, big river. It's a big river. It forms a lot of the border between Washington and a state and Oregon. And this comes from the Longview Daily News. What do you got for a title? UK's largest renewable energy supplier is building a plant along the Columbia River. Yeah, Drax. It's the self-described largest power station in the UK is building a power plant along the Columbia River in Longview, Washington, to harvest wood pellets for Asia to generate power. Drax aims to use that's the... That's not good news. Huh? That's not good news. No, look at that. That's a, that's a picture of the, of the forest land. I think that picture is probably not... Uh, is of land that's probably not... In, in jeopardy because it's in a park. But, you know, this is to replace coal in, in plants in Asia. And well, they're replacing coal, that's good, but using wood pellets, that's, that, that's from going from bad to worse. Cutting forests, which are our, one of our major uh, areas for drawing down carbon, prevents well, climate. Yeah. That's, that's not good, and then you burn it. Okay, so theoretically, the, the carbon atoms go round and round, and I, I thought this was a good thing when we started this show 11 or 12 years ago. But, um, you know, in time, we've, we've had to reconcile to the fact that that is not good. Okay, now here's some good news. And we have a picture of olivine. Do you know what olivine is? Well, I'm going to tell us what it is. <laughs> okay. It's a group of silicate, come on, my, silicate mineral salts that are usually green in color right. and have compositions that range between magnesium-2, silicon oxide-4, and iron oxide, iron silicon oxide-4. Yeah. That particular rock... They're, they're, they're silicate minerals. Yes. That particular rock that we're looking at is not terribly impressive looking, except that it's green, and green is a little weird. But for those who are interested, olivine is, um, is the, the rough mineral, or a, any mineral that, in, that is of a type that can be gem quality, and when it is, it's called peridot. And um, peridot gems are green gems, kind of cloudy. They're not like they're not krill, clear like emerald, but they're they can be quite beautiful. Okay, what do you, this is from EIN News. What do you have for title? Olivine colon natural solution to combat climate change. Yeah, Sahit Munja or Muja, I guess, the founder and CEO of Global Mining Green Minerals and Albanian Minerals that's three different companies, emphasizes magnesium olivine's role as an eco-friendly building block poised to eliminate one trillion tons, that is a thousand billion tons, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It could be a natural solution to climate change challenges. Just step in the right direction, anyhow. Yeah, I guess it is. A trillion is a lot. And um, what this means is that we could draw down a trillion tons. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that olivine naturally degrades. And what we would be doing would be degrading the olivine faster than it would normally de be degraded by pulling it out of the ground and cr crushing it. That, that stone would be crushed. And um, you, you crush it, and it draws down CO2. We're, we're all a bit behind schedule here, Tom. We should get going. Let's okay. move on. Let's do it. Um, here we have a picture of, a blast furnace. of a, yeah, this is steel making. And um, this is from Clean Technica. 
transforming the U.S. steel industry called a Great Lakes Memo Series. Yeah, the Great Lakes from Minnesota to Pennsylvania are a regional powerhouse in steel making. The region has 60% of all steel production capacity in the United States. And the making steel uses a lot of energy. Yeah, and it has 100% of coal-based steel production. Rocky Mountain Institute has produced a series of state-specific memos on reducing emissions. And of course, you can go to Clean Technica and find this particular uh, article and um, find you know what what it is for various states, um, and that can be a help. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm a little behind. Well, Becky uses a lot of energy, and it, it's it it does. Bad, bad, bad energy it's using up. Yeah. Okay, we are up to Monday, February 12th, and we have another picture of a ship with rotor sails. This one's got six rotors. Yep, and uh, this is from Clean Technica also. What do you have for a title? Future fleet of low emission roll, roll on, roll offs to use Norse power rotor sails. A uh, French ship owner, Louis Dreyfus, uh, Armateur, SAS, and the Finnish um, Mechanical Sail Company, Norse Power, OI Limited. I don't know. I, I think OI is like um, company. I think incorporated, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's announced that Norse Power rotor sail technology will be installed on a low emission roll on, roll off fleet that will be chartered to Airbus. So ships of that type. An entire fleet is going to be made up of, of um, w with those roll-on, roll-off um, sails, and it makes me think. We live in a in a society that is almost grotesquely self-indulgent. I think people have to have cars. People have to have airplanes. You can't go from United. If you can't go from Boston to Liverpool by plane, by ship. You have to go by plane. And I'll tell you, I would love to go, you know, across the ocean by ship. Not that it's ever going to happen, but you know, I would. I've been across the ocean by plane. It's very yeah. Boring. That would be a good cruise. That, that, Wouldn't that, that be fun? That could, that could be very relaxing. Yeah. Okay. We have a picture of a monarch butterfly. And uh, oh, this is from, quiet a little bit. Yeah, this is from ABC News. Why, there may be much fewer monarch butterfly sightings this summer. Yes, and... That's I, not good news at all. It, it isn't. Let me read the, the uh, synopsis, and then I'll make a, uh, an observation. Monarch butterfly sightings may be sparser than usual in the United States and Canada following a drastic drop in populations wintering in Mexico. This will not have an effect on the East Coast. This is the West Coast. East Coast uh, populations of monarchs don't overwinter in Mexico. Reacher, researchers told ABC News, the biggest threats monarchs face are habitat loss and changes in weather patterns. Now, here's the thing, and I'm going to put that picture up. I'm sorry I didn't do it before. Um, the, the uh, low populations that they have this winter are not quite as low as the lowest they've had, which they had several years ago. The thing is, monarchs are facing a lot of threats, and for the population to bounce back, they're going to have to be guarded. And that is true all over the United States. And by the way... Uh, the monarchs like milkweed, is it, is it that but butterfly? They like milkweed, and I didn't catch the question. Okay. You want to ask it again? Well, that was it. The, the monarchs uh, are, are the butterflies that, that like milkweed. Yes, they are. They are. And by the way, there's a there's an invasive species. <laughs> there's an invasive species that has tiny purple flowers, and it has a, a a leaf shaped like an arrowhead, and it has a funny pod that's about an inch and a half long and tapers on both ends and then it that breaks open and the and the um, the seeds come out uh, suspended rather like 
uh, the seeds of milkweed. The monarch butterflies mistake those plants for milkweed, lay eggs on them, and the and the the larvae. And the eggs don't develop properly. Yeah, the 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 larvae cannot develop on that stuff, and it is a species that's invasive. It's called, believe it or not, dog strangling vine. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. They don't strangle dogs. I don't. I don't know why they call it dog strangling vine, but it, it's all over Brattleboro, and so you know. It is, huh? Yeah, it's it's all over. We have it, and my landlady goes out and pulls them as often as she can all summer long because otherwise they they will take over. Okay, we have a really nice picture next. This is a a place. Uh, I looked up how to pronounce this. I can't do it. I don't remember. But um, it's a it's a town in Poland. Um, okay, what do you got for a for a title? This is from DW, which is Deutsche Welle, which means German wave. And what do you have for for a title? Poland, Poland. Spa town turns to renewable energy for clear air. Okay, smog enveloping the Polish spa town of what's it call it was anathema to its image as a health resort. After choking on polluted air for many years, the town turned to renewables to help clean up its act and improve its air quality and managed to reduce electricity costs a lot in the process. Clearly, we've talked about this before. Yeah, yeah. You, you reduce costs and you reduce um, uh, uh, pollution at the same time. And everything, everything is better. Okay, we have, a, we have an item from Renews. And this picture is a picture of, I think that actually is the wind turbine that is in the, in the news, that crane that's putting up the blade so that it can be bolted to the to the uh, rotor. So the story, the picture is wind turbines construction. Yeah, I've never seen a crane like that before. But when you consider the the size of the blade, it's oh yeah. Uh, okay, this is from Renews. What do you have for title? Atlas Copco powers up 16 megawatts of an offshore turbine. Now that's that's a new record. That's a new record. Atlas Copco has supplied a QES60 power generator for the successful installation of the world's first 16 megawatt offshore wind turbine in southeast China's Fujian province. The 16 megawatt unit has the world's longest turbine blades at 123 meters. Now, that's 400 feet. That's 403 and a half feet. That blade that you see being attached to the rotor is considerably longer than a football field, including end zones. That's a balancing act, isn't it? Isn't it? And each blade weighs 54 tons. Wow. And that's T-O-N-N-E-S, which means it's metric tons. Okay. Of course, same thing. What? Close to the same thing. They're very close. Metric tons and tonnies are pretty much the same thing. Okay, we have a picture of an electric truck. And this article comes from Clean Technica. Looks like, well, it looks like a regular truck to me. How do you know it's electric? Well, because the, it says so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mars will bring 300 electric heavy-duty trucks to European fleets by 2030. And that's Mars bars. That's Mars bars. That's right. And a bunch of other things. Mars Incorporated recently partnered with freight technology company Einride, or Einride, Einride, Einride. I don't know how you pronounce that in German. I think it's probably Einride uh, because the ride part is English. To add 300 electric heavy duty trucks to the Mars European fleet, Bjorn Andersek. Mars Global Supply Chain Transformation Lead, imagine having that as a title for your, for your job, answered some questions for, for Clean Technica. Now, I don't think we're going to go into the questions on this, but um, unless you have some reason to, Tom. But if you want to find out about these things, um, uh, um, 
audience members can go to Clean Technica and, and find out. So, well, my nephew works for, for, for Mars in transportation. Yeah. So he's involved in this, in this, in this story. For oh, really? Some reason. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I used to work in a town where Mars had a factory, and it was a, it was a big employer in the town. But I never got worked for it myself. Okay, we have an article from Clean Technica. We got a picture of a Chevrolet Equinox electric vehicle. That's right, we do. What do you have for title? Thirty-four thousand nine hundred ninety-five dollars Chevy Equinox EV is coming later this year. People will be able to buy the 1LT base model of the Equinox EV at a starting price of $34,995 plus a destination fee of $1,395 later this year, Chevrolet says. The Equinox EV will be eligible for the full $7,500 federal tax credit or rebate making the net cost $31,090, which is well below the average new, uh, U.S. new car cost. So well, that's interesting. It's going to, uh, going to see, well, it's going to boost the sales of these electric cars. I think it will. I, I, I shudder when I read this, though, because I remember when my father bought a uh, 1959 Pontiac station wagon, and uh, it cost close to three thousand dollars and my mother was kind of upset <laughs> that he would buy a car that cost so much money okay we are up to wednesday february 14th and we have a picture of wind turbines what are, imagine that wind turbines of all things. It, looks like it looks like it to me yeah and uh this is from metis global China's renewables installations surpass expectations, but potential utilization risks exist. China is set to reach its 2030 goal, which it set in 2020, I believe, and solar capacity target of 1.2 terawatts, that is 1,200 gigawatts, and they're set to, to reach that this year, six years early. So they're installing these things, uh, wind and solar and so forth, um, more than twice as fast as they had set as a goal. Uh, with an installed capacitor already reaching 1.1 terawatts by, end of, uh, by year's end of 2023, and this is according to Fitch. You're almost there. Yeah. The China Electricity Council forecasts 260 gigawatts of new installations for 2024. So the Chinese are moving very fast. And like they are. Yeah, they are. But you know, there's something weird about this, which is they're still installing coal burning power plants. Well, I guess they got a lot of coal they want to burn up. Either that or they are bound and determined to uh, build out manufacturing facilities and hire people for jobs and stuff of that nature. Or even, I mean, it's only, I remember that we reported when China had electricity at the last of the villages that had never had electricity before. And that was just during the time this show has been on the air. There, there may still be people. It's, in China. it's a communist country that's more capitalist than most of us. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, more capitalist and it's, um, frankly, I think it can be abusive. So yes. I'm, I'm not an expert on living in China, but, you know, I can tell you that I would prefer not to. Thank you very much. Okay, we have an item coming. Oh, here we got a nice picture of some uh, cooling towers. Yeah, cooling towers. And this is a coal-burning power plant. And if you look from the, from the left, ramping upward, there are, there are those long um, conveyor belts that raise coal up. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. So you can tell that, and the and the shape of the of the taller chimneys, you can tell this is a coal burning power plant, not a nuclear plant or gas plant or something. This is from Renew Economy. Well, it says that you might have to help me with this. A E L and A E M O. Yeah. Search for answers on. Loy Yang outage. Now you'd think that Loy Yang would be a Chinese name, but it isn't. It's it's uh, Australian. In Victoria, the Australian state, storms tr uh, tore down at least six transmission towers on one of the main uh, 500 kilovolt transmission lines, triggering a massive frequency excursion that took 2,700 megawatts of generating capacity in, in uh, offline, including the Loyang plant. It is Loyang A, which is a brown coal generator, uh, which is owned by AGL. Now that plant shut down because of a storm. And the storm, the damage that it did was it tore down six transmission lines uh, that were 500 kilovolt. Now, 500 kilovolt is these are these are high high power lines. Yeah, for sure. And it tore down six transmission lines. It just absolutely crumpled a couple of them. And they're saying that it's going to take a bit of time to get things back together again. And predictably, the the press that is the conservative pro fossil fuel etc press has um, been blaming wind power and solar power for this outage that brought well, they mentioned a, it's a massive frequency excursion yes that's well, right when you, when, it, when you lose energy it compensates by changing the frequency so yes. everybody's clock went wrong yeah and and it gets worse than that because it meant that a lot of people lost power. I mean, if if you have a frequency excursion and things get bad enough, the the um, electricity supplier will simply shut everything it, down. It shuts it off, right? Because if they don't, it's going to be more than your clock going off. It's going to be um, all, all sorts of machinery. Yeah, motors will overheat and die, and then you've got to replace the motor because you've had uh, a power outage, and you know, so what they do is they guard against that by shutting things down. It's a serious problem, especially yeah. during the summer, which is what it is in Australia right now, because it means that um, if you don't shut down the air conditioning and refrigerating and freezer units that you're supplying electricity to can lose their motors, which means they're no good anymore. Yeah. But it also happens at the very moment that people want to have their air conditioning going. So this is a problem. And of course, the pro-fossil fuels people are uh, upset at wind power and solar power and blaming it in the press, even though it wasn't involved. I should yeah, say- Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, I should say one other thing, and that is the, um, the uh, Australian conservative politicians they aren't called it conservative, by the way. They're called liberal. Um, <laughs> That's true. It is true, yeah. Have been saying that they want nuclear power plants. And one of them, in the last day or two, admitted that those power plants could not come online for at least 20 years. But Wow, 20 years. One thing that they oh. can do is they can prevent the fact that they're building these plants means that the current batch of coal and gas uh, uh, powered power plants might not shut down because they're being replaced by nuclear. So that's why you support well, nuclear. George Bush would have said nuclear. 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 That's right. Yep. Okay. Our last story. A of a transformer. That's a transformer. That particular transformer is not in the United States, however. Uh huh. The story came from Renews. So what do you Siemens. have? Siemens. Yeah. Which is what a German company. It's a German company, and it's a big 
elect, uh, a, a company making electrical gear. It is sort of like a competitor to General Electric. That's right, it is. Siemens invests in U.S. transformer factories. This is interesting. Yeah, why didn't, why didn't uh, a General Electric invest in this factory? I don't know. Siemens Energy is investing $150 million in a, in a power transformer factory in Charlotte, North Carolina, creating almost 600 local jobs. Today, only 20% of U.S. large power transformer demand is met by domestic supply with lead times of up to five years, according to the company. Now, we talked about reliance, reliability, and transformers years ago when we had that, the, the stuff about um, the possibility of a, a coronal discharge from the sun hitting the earth and frying transformers, which would mean that basically the power grid in the United States, whole United States, was threatened with outage that could last up to three and a half years. And that's a long time to go without that's your a long time. without Boy. your heat, sure. without your your you know whatever you've got. Um, and there was a there was a lot of concern about that. Um, the the uh, the next thing that happened was uh, we had the the uh, statement that that one came from FERC, but the um, security people said, by the way, if if we have an atomic blast in the right place, um, it could it could shut down the American grid for for about a year and a half. And then, within less than a week of the first of these announcements, that character who's running North Korea said, and I know how to do that. And um, I have not been hearing a lot of information about the American grid being beefed up, but, um, you know, for, for security. But in those days, none of our transformers were made in the United States. They were all made in India or China. And now they're saying that only 20% of the demand is being met by domestic supply, which means somebody has already opened transformer plants, and now we're um, opening another one. Somebody in the know, somebody who's in the business of trying to maintain this stuff is actually paying attention. That's good to know. Yes. Yeah, so we're up to the end of the blind. Tom. I was just going to say, this is, this is the end of our show here, yeah, isn't it? and our last slide says, have a delightfully agreeable week. Let me put that up so everybody can see it, so they can know that I'm actually telling the truth. The slide says exactly what I just said. I am going to wave, wave goodbye. Tom is going to wave goodbye. And what about Tom's cat? Well, come back and see us now, you hear? That's right. Is your cat waving goodbye? I don't know. The cat hasn't watched the show at all. I don't know where he's hiding. He always hides during the show. He used to wave goodbye. <laughs> anyway, y'all come back and see us now, you hear?